Um, yeah, so as Chris said, um, I know a lot of you know me from my YouTube channel. Um, this is sort of my day job, which is um, I've sort of got a reputation amongst the sort of art, architecture, lighting, design community in London as the guy that can just get, get stuff working. Um, so these are just a few pictures of um, some of the various installations, like some mutant pandas and UFOs and other crazy things. And what I'm talking about is really that when you're dealing with art, it's a bit different to like traditional engineering in that, um, you know, your traditional engineering, it's your, you're solving a fairly well-defined, fairly specific problem. So, you know, your problem might come from, you know, here, we want to make this product, or we've got some specific problem that we need to solve. Um, we want to do something, we don't quite know what, but we'll do something, or um, just, uh, yeah, let's... <laughs> <laughs> So that, that, that's sort of really fairly traditional approach. So the process of that is, you know, you start with a problem, you start looking at what parts to use. Maybe you look at uh, some websites at some sort of place that's not too far away from there may be supporting. Um, but, you know, you decide what parts to use. You then go into, like, the production engineering side, figure out how do you make it cheaper. Then get onto the really boring stuff, the documentation, production tests, certification. And by that time, you're so bored of this thing, you just want to go home and do something new and take something apart. Now, I don't, do, I don't really get involved in that sort of stuff nowadays because it, so my, my interest curve is sort of exponential. I really love the design and problem solving side, but as we go down that, that list, I get less and less interested in things. So um, the stuff I do now, you know, that, that sort of tends to cut off much earlier. Um, so here is a typical approach which has you know, resulted in some you know, qu quite interesting jobs. Here's something interesting. Oh, they're cheap. <laughs> what can I make with it? Um, this is a one that also one of these occasions where nothing beats a paper catalogue to just browse through and find cool, interesting stuff. So, you know, well, what, you know, how cheaply can we make it do something interesting or how many can we use or, you know, just, you know, let, let's, let's do something cool with it. So what quite often happens is I'll, you know, maybe build some sort of demonstration unit, say I'll find a, an interesting display, I'll make up a little demo unit, show it to some of my customers, who, and that'll just spark an idea in them, yeah, that'll get their creativity going, they'll maybe pitch it to a client or do, do, do something around it. Um, and they like toys, I mean, who doesn't like to toys? And when you're not necessarily solving specific problems, you've got a fairly sort of free canvas to do stuff, then, you know, the scope for integrating those toys and, you know, turning it into a business. So, um, the specific project I want to talk about came from, li literally, this is how it all started. I found these camera modules on eBay. You could buy a tray of 70, they're a bit more expensive than that. I think they're about 100 bucks for a tray of 70 um, when I first found them. I think maybe they saw some demand and they've gone up a little bit. But they're dirt cheap, they're little camera modules. They're, um, I think they go up to VGA or possibly one step higher than that. Um, but yeah, they're cheap, they've got the lens, they're packaged, they're usable. And uh, unusually, they're, there's, there's plenty of documentation. Now, Omnivision specifically are very sort of cagey with their documentation, but some of them, the you know, data sheets have leaked out. So there's actually quite a lot of information. And probably the most useful piece of information on these is the actual register set. Um, a lot of them you can get the data sheets and they'll tell you what all the registers do. And the power up default values on the registers are invariably utterly useless. They will not do anything sensible if you just power them up. And there are lots of sort of magic registers that are either not documented, they don't tell you what they are, but basically you really need to start off with a set of register values which make it do something vaguely useful. Once you've got that, you can then start tweaking them. And these are generally initialized, initialized through I2C. It's very common, pretty much all camera modules. All the registers are set up through I2C. But you know, one of the nice things about this module, there were tons of stock, they were cheap, and they were documented. So it was actually quite easy to get these doing something. So, well, what do we, what do we want to do with the camera? Well, connect it to an LCD so you can see the image. I mean, what, what else would you do with the camera? Um, in terms of the complexity, again, we want to keep this simple, you know, this really comes from, you know, how cheap and simply can we do something interesting with this device? We don't want to, like, just stick it into a Raspberry Pi or some massive computer thing. That, that, that sort of really defeats the point. So um, I figured, well, yeah, well, you've got this stream of data coming out of the camera. You can set the camera into a RGB 565 format, and that matches nicely with the format of the uh, most LCD modules. So, um, okay, the, the cheapest general module, yeah, resolution for LCDs is QVGA, 320 by 240. Um, 
So they tend to be a, a, a little bit on the small side. So, okay, you can make a little sort of thing that's about that bigger. I've actually got a single unit there, which I'll uh, show you later. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit small. You know, art needs to be big and impressive and whatever. So, um, so let, let's, let, let's use loads of them. So um, the nice thing about doing that is that, you know, you can scale the art according to your budget. So, you know, how, how, you almost sort of by the yard. How, how much art would you like, sir? <laughs> so, yeah, re re repeat until you either run out of money, run out of wall, or whatever, or you, you use up all the stock. Um, so we settled, I was in discussion with uh, my, my customer that was particularly interested in, the, in this. So we figured that a 12 by 15 array was quite a nice thing. So that, that gives like a wall hanging piece like about so, so big. So this, this is what became uh, Vanity Mirror, which he, I think they've sold, I think, two of these at some ludicrous price. Um, so I'm just going to go into the actual, te you know, the, the technical, what, what's actually inside this, how everything was done. So the first question is, well, okay, we've got this image data coming out of the camera, we've got this display, well, do we actually need to actually store this at all? Now, it's not that much, 150K, I mean, these days 150K isn't much, but it's generally too much for a small cheap microcontroller and particularly a small cheap microcontroller that comes in a package that you can put on a two layer PCB because again you know you want to make this big thing you don't want to use more PCB layers than you need to because some of that PCB is really just mechanical and it's not really doing anything so you don't have to pay for those extra layers that aren't um, doing much work so you think well RAM you know external RAM is cheap you can get like a one mega SRAM for maybe a buck or so but the problem is although the memory is, ch is cheap actually making use of, it, use of it can be surprisingly expensive because generally it needs quite a lot of pins. That means you tend to go to a bigger package, which then means it's, it's a struggle to get it on the two-layer PCB. So whether you're using a microcontroller or a, an FPGA or CPLD, you need quite a lot of pins, particularly for a static RAM, because you've got like a, the address bus and the data bus. So you know, we'd like to avoid having that if we can. But... The LCD module already has, an, has a frame memory. You know, it's the type of LCD module where you can just send commands, it will display that stuff, and it stays displayed. So you already have, have a frame of memory in the LCD. So well, well, let's use that. You know, don't, don't spend any more money on it. Use, use that memory, um, which is fine. There's a few little issues that I found when I was actually... I, I had like a few different LCD modules I was playing with with, with a few different control ICs. And it turns out that, obviously, most people use an LCD as a display, and not many people actually use the functionality to read the data back from that memory, um, which means I found that the documentation is sometimes vague, sketchy, in some cases downright wrong, um, and in some cases just not very well implemented. For example, most LCDs have configuration bits that let you tell you, if you squirt day trap them, like which way up it has to go, whether it's going left to right, right to left, top to bottom, whether it's you know, the, the, um, the red and green light that way around or that way around which is great, it's very flexible, but when you read it back, some of them take notice of those orientations, and some of them you always get the data out the, yeah, according to the physical orientation of the LCD, regardless of how it was written. So there's a, a few little things that you need to watch out for. There. It's, most of this stuff is stuff you can deal with, but you have to mess around with the LCD to figure out what it actually does, because the data sheet is either not sufficiently clear or not sufficiently correct to be able to just, just, just work from the data sheet. So th this is our basic bare minimum system. And for those of you, um, uh, anyone who doesn't know what a CPLD is? Good, okay. It's a, a very simple logic device. It's like um, a smaller version of an FPGA. It's got some very simple logic um, that you can custom program. Now, one issue, the um, LCD modules tend to come in 8-bit and 16-bit variants. It's generally selected by a pin on the um, driver chip, but quite often that pin is bonded. When you get the LCD, it comes with a little, little flex PCB with a driver on it, and they quite often bond out that, that 16 and 8-bit heart, you know, to, to, so you buy the LCD, and it's a 16-bit because they've hard-coded that pin. Now, the, the very simplest approach would be to take the 8-bit camera data and feed it into an 8-bit LCD. But because the LCDs have these long flex cables, there's a limit to how high a frequency you can send data to them. And in, from memory, this is something around the 8 to 12 megahertz before they start getting really flaky. So by using a 16-bit LCD, we can write twice as much data within that clock rate limitation. Um, 
yeah, th this thing did work with 8 bits, but the frame weight was a little bit on the It was like sub, sub 30 frames a second. And um, one of the things I wanted to do was to run the camera at a high resolution and then crop a small frame out of it. That wasn't actually possible with an 8 bit. Um, is, is, is this a bit to echo? I'm hearing some feedback. You, does this sound okay? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so we use, a, yeah, there's not a lot of cost difference between the 8 and 16 bit LCDs. The only difference is you, they tend to come with a wider connector. Um, so, most of what the CPL did is, is, is taking that 8-bit data, latching it so you get t two bytes out of the camera for each pixel for your 16 bits of um, 5 bits uh, red, 6 bits green, 5 bits of blue data. And that, that's then clocked as a single pixel into the LCD. So, this is our yeah, minimum system. So, what we can do with this, we can have a live image, just continuously showing live image to the LCD. We can freeze the image because the LCD has the memory. We just stop sending it data and it freezes the last image. And we can then, if we've got lots of them, we can actually tell it to freeze at different times. So instead of just capturing one image or one set of images, we can time stagger it so we can do like bullet time type effects. We can do some motion capture. So if you're moving in front of it, each cam will capture a different part of that motion. Um, there's a few other things you can do just by tweaking the camera parameters. There's various like clock dividers and um, params you can mess around within the camera. So, for example, you can get pixel doubling. You can pan it within a window so you can get some sort of scrolling effects. And you can do a few silly things like just color inversion and one or two other things. Um, the other thing you can do is flash the backlight. Now, you might say, well, that, that's a bit silly. Why would you want to do that? That actually turns out to be really interesting because if you're displaying a live continuously running image and you then suddenly freeze it, it's not necessarily immediately obvious that that's what you've done. So if, for example, you're trying to do a sequenced ca image capture, if you just blink the backlight very briefly, it gives you that very sort of visual feedback that says, I've just taken that photo. So for example, if you're doing a, like a, a long strip in a row, if you just sequentially freeze it, it's actually not that obvious. But if you just give that backlight just that little blink, you actually, it makes it very obvious as to what you're actually doing. That, that's actually a very effective um, cue. Um, <clears throat> So, okay, that's handled the actual data flow. Now, we do also need some processing for a few things. One is to actually control all these things. Because it's a bit boring having this thing just capturing data and displaying. You want to have some control over it. You might want to tell it when to capture the image. You want to do this image sequencing. The other thing you need to do is set up the camera I squared C registers. There's generally quite a lot, like maybe 100 or so registers that you need to write to get it to do anything. Um, so you need to be able to do that. There's a few little commands you need to send to the LCD to get the LCD out of power-up mode, tell it which way around the display. Um, although you, 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 you can do that through the CPLD. Um, but the, the, the main thing you can't really do in the CPLD is do this I squared C initialization. Um, so in principle, you could use like a, probably something like an 8-bit pick or something to do this if you want to literally squeeze the last penny out of it. But you know, slightly more po powerful processes aren't that more, much more expensive. So. Um, one of my favourite uh, families is the PIC 32MX1 series from Microchip. Um, a number of reasons, mostly not actually related to the architecture. Things like you can get the same part in four different packages from a QFN, a SSOP, an SO, or a DIP. Um, it's got quite a lot of RAM. You can get Microchip to pre program them for not, not that much money, which can be really useful if you're using a lot of them. Um, it's got a few ni quite, yeah, quite nice features. You've got the internal oscillator, which is accurate enough to do your art communications, so you don't need a, need a crystal. Um, you've got two fast SPI ports. You've got DMA capability if you want to just sling data around uh, quite quickly. Um, the, it's got a pretty fast UART, so on a 48 megahertz clock, it will actually do up to um, 4 mega board, um, which can be quite handy if you're... Yeah, th th that's really for hauling the image data back. Once you've captured that image, you might want to pull it back to your control PC. So you get a pretty decent um, speed out of it. Um, so we, yeah, we have image. Re this, this whole thing is controlled by a Raspberry Pi. <coughs> um, we can also output data from the pick onto the LCD. So if we wanted to put a logo or just some colours or shapes on the LCD, we, we can do that. That's sort of something. I don't think they actually do that, but it's something that, that's pretty much for free. The other useful thing it can do is it can program the CPLD. CPLDs are non-volatile devices, so you have to program them. And um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, so you need to program them. So to avoid one thing that you can do is you, the microcontroller can do that for you. So you can actually, the, the, unlike an FPGA, the actual contents of the CPLD are quite small. So you can actually just embed that in your microcontroller source code and have the microcontroller program the CPLD over the JTAG interface. So that's one less thing you need to do in, in production. You program your micro, your micro 
act as like some function of the CPLD that's, that's actually put in there to determine whether it's programmed or not. And if it's not, it just program, uh, updates it. It's one less thing you have to do. And the other thing, um, SPLI flash memories are really cheap. So, well, let's sling one of those on. So it means we can actually store some images locally. So we can you know, capture an image, program it into the SPI flash. I can't remember. That takes a few hundred milliseconds. And then we can go back to a live display. So we can store images locally. And then later, we can then call up those images and display them. For example, if you want to capture a sequence of images and display them without having to stick it all through the um, RS-485 interface. Again, that's something which I don't think we're actually using at the moment. But um, well, actually, one thing that is handy, if you want to capture an image fairly quickly, um, it obviously takes quite a long time to download that through your 4 megabar board RS-485 interface. So it means it allows you to capture the images fairly quickly, return to the live display, and then in the background, you can then start pulling that data, either pulling that data back over RS-485 or just keep capturing into memory and then download them later at your leisure. Because obviously, you've got 180 images. That's quite, a, even at QVAGA, that's quite a lot of data. So um, you can keep your thing doing something interesting while you're actually sort of taking all this data back and doing some, something with it in the background. Um, and say so SPI flashes, they're, they're stupidly cheap. You can get four, mega, four megabit SPI flashes are about 30 odd cents from expansion, so there, it's almost stupid not to put one on there. Again, I'm not sure if they're actually using this at the moment, but it's there to be used um, if they want to. Um, communications, um, obviously you want these things to talk to, talk to, to um, back to base. RS-485 is my go-to communications protocol because it's simple, it's cheap, it's robust. Um, on this, th so th this is sort of an arrangement about sort of that big. So four mega board, totally reliable, it just, it just works. Um, it's split up into four buses because 180 is quite a lot of loading on one RS-485 bus. So it, there's four separate buses, 45, board, 45 camera modules per bus. And we use the uh, FTDI's FT4232H, which is a USB to quad UART chip. Um, and as long as you get the packet sizes right, you can effectively stream all those buses simultaneously. Um, so we get a, um, we can read back the image in every image from all 180 and under, under 30 seconds. The other thing we can do, obviously what you might want to do is some interesting effects by like, having lots of these things doing different things at various times. And it can be tricky to actually um, get that all timed right. So one facility we have is when we send it a command, there's a bit that we can set in that command that says, don't do this now, just remember it. And then so we send that command to each, each of these units in turn. We then set a broadcast command that says go. So for example, we could send a command that says, um, grab a frame now, then the next unit will say grab a frame with one frame delay, next one with two frames delay. If we can set all that up, and it doesn't, don't you worry, don't care how long that takes. And then we say go, and it will just, do, every, every one of those will act on that command simultaneously, um, and then do whatever it needs to do. Um, so again, that's a, a very simple uh, thing in, in the software, but it's actually very powerful um, in, the, in what it allows you to do. <coughs> now, um, each of these units has its individual ID, because obviously we, need to, need, we want to be able to talk to each one individually. So the question is, how do you assign the IDs? Again, this is a production issue. And what we do, one of the things we can do with this camera is we can read the auto level control, which basically gives a figure that says roughly how much light is coming into this camera. So we've got a, an address ID assignment mode, which is like a factory programming thing, where we say there's a command that says, if you can see light now, you're address number three. And if, you, uh, and if you see that, you know, give me a reply. So our pro programming process is to set these things up in a slightly dark room, run an automatic thing that starts at address one, and we take a torch or flashlight for the American guys, you shine it at the camera, the screen changes colours to acknowledge that it's done it, the, the system that's doing it sees that, and it goes on to the next screen. So literally, you, you, all you do is stand there and go, doink, 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 once in turn, the screen changes, and that's all your 180 IDs programmed in about a minute. Works really nicely. Um, just need to make sure that you haven't got any bright room lights, because if you get the lighting wrong, it just goes completely crazy, and all the IDs go all over the place. But that's, that's quite a neat um, thing. Um, this board here, basically, we want, um, we, obviously, we've got custom boards for all the cameras and the LCDs. So this board is really, really to mop up all the odd little bits and pieces. So it's the USB to Quad RS-485 interface. Um, these are flat flex, I'll go into the interconnect in a second. But it also, th this thing runs off a 24 volt supply. It also produces five volts for the Raspberry Pi. So literally the system is all the camera boards, this board and a Raspberry Pi, no extra mains adapters or other messy things. So it's a nice, neat, you know, ready to go system. 
Um, so the CPLD, I say these are yeah, pretty old tech, these are like 20 year old technology, but it, if you want just some really simple logic functions, they're nice and there are, they have advantages over FPGAs. Um, for, lo- for very simple functionality, they're, they're a bit cheaper. Um, they're also available in more sensible pin counts. One big problem with FPGAs is nobody makes FPGAs with low pin counts. And the reason that's a problem is if you want to do it on a two layer board, you know, you end up using a huge amount of space. Now, we wanted to keep the whole PCB within the, out- the LCDs we're using are about that big, and we wanted to keep the whole thing within that outline. So we are a bit tight on board space, especially as we've got the connectors for the LCD and everything. So um, the only way to get an FPGA that size is to go to a BGA package, which needs multi-layers, and it's just, just horrible. Um, so these are available in like QFP 44, 48, I think 64 pins. They're non-volatility, you know, you turn them on, they're ready to go. Single power supply, um, so it's really easy to route them on a two-layer PCB. Um, and so all it's really doing is it's acting as a, a register to um, route that fairly high-speed data. It's data that's coming in at um, about of the order of 12 or 24 megahertz. I can't remember. I think it's 24 megahertz is the fastest thing it, it actually sees. Um, so it takes the parallel 8-bit camera data, fans it out to the 16-bit data bus with two latches, it also provides an interface so that the PIT can talk to the LCD via SPI. Um, one nice thing uh, about the Lattice, I don't know, Xilinx and Altera may do a similar thing, but they actually provide you some source code, which you just stick that into your code, and it implements all the JTAG programming protocol. All you do is you add your own little module that literally tells it how to set four pins high or low, and you can take the, when you've compiled, yeah, you design your CPL with a high-level language like VHDL or Verilog, and their programming tool, you take the output, the, the, um, the file that you would normally program into the device using a dedicated programmer, it will generate a C source file of basically a const array with all that data. So you just take those C files, take that, that, that file, and your, your header that tells it how to wiggle the pins, and it just works, it's brilliant. So yeah, f- for a system just to build program, pr- yeah, program itself, it, it, it's great, it, it, it just works, no messing about, brilliant. Um, so basically, these are th- this is what's inside the CPLD. We've got basically a, a 16-bit register. Um, there's also this divide by 640, which I'll go into in a second. So um, there's, there's, three th- there's three jobs it has to do. The first job is live display from the camera to the LCD. So it takes our 8-bit camera data, and on every other pixel clock, it latches it here, then it latches it there, and it divides that by two and gives a write enable to the LCD. So every two pixel clocks we get from the camera, um, produce one 16-bit write signal to the LCD. So the LCD is effectively clocking at half the speed of the camera, so um, it gives plenty of you know, time for the data to get through and not get, not get uh, anywhere near its timing limitations. Um, the other thing it's got, it's, um, there's also a counter so that um, you can count exactly one line's worth of pixels so that this can actually generate a window, because sometimes what you want to do is um, put the camera into, say, VGA mode, so it's 640 pixels, which gives 1280 clocks, and you want to actually select only the first 640. You can mess around with the I2C registers to tell it where in the image to start, but there's some issues with actually getting it to stop. So the easiest thing is the CPLD just, just um, clocks out 640 pixels and then stops. And every, at the start of each line, the pick then manually... Um, resets everything because yeah, we're, we're talking we're, at the end of each line. We've got a few microseconds, which is plenty of time for a pick interrupt to set everything up ready for the next line. Reset everything, and then we, we, we then grab the next line into the LCD. Um, the second function is when we want the pick to write into the LCD. So we have exactly the same register, but this time it's an SPI register. We just take our pick SPI clock. Um, we shift our data, just get shifts in, and then it divide by 16 generates the right signal. So we can just throw a torrent of data out of the pick, and it will generate the right signal every 16 clocks. So we can just blast data into the um, LCD. We can use DMA to do that as well. So we can get very high bandwidth from the pick to the LCD. The times we'd use this is if, for example, we wanted to, say, flash a, a fixed color block on the LCD, or we want to display an image from the onboard SPI flash to the LCD. And what we can do there is we can have a foreground task that's reading data out of the SPA, SPI flash into pick memory, generally maybe one or two lines at a time, because you haven't got enough memory to store the whole image. And at the same time, it's using DMA to output that data to the LCD. So you've got a very high bandwidth way of getting data from that um, SPI flash to the LCD. 
Um, and the final function is to take the data from the LCD to the pixel if you want to read back all these images. And again, it's pretty much the same. Um, we use SPI. Again, we, this time we take the data in from the LCD, clock it through, and then spit it out to the pic. So uh, very, you know, it's very simple functionality. Um, I think we're only using about sort of 60% of the, the um, device. Um, to do that, so it's you know, way way simpler than what what you need FPGA to do. It's it's, it's a very nice fit um, for the job. There's a few other basically there's, there's two mode pins that the, the um, pig just selects those two mode pins, one of these three modes, and there's an additional mode that lets it just read back some fixed pattern, just so it knows that the the, the CPLD is there and has been programmed. If it's not, then it uses that to trigger the um, the JTAG programming process a, a, as a sort of factory operation. Um, Power supply, so 180 cameras, 100 LCDs, that's going to take quite a bit of power. Now, <coughs> the only fixed voltage that we need, the camera, analog voltage, has to be 2.8 volts. But it turns out pretty much everything else will also work on 2.8 volts. There's the camera digital supply, the LCD analog and digital supply, and the PIC, they will, and the CPLD will all quite happily work on 2.8 volts. So one problem when you start taking like these simple things and doing lots of them okay, you know, this thing is simple, that thing is simple, then you start having the power supply and all the little details can actually start really piling up and add it, adding to your cost and complexity. So it's quite nice that we've got basically one single power supply running everything. We distribute power at 24 volts because, of course, with that, that amount of power, if we didn't do that, the current would be ridiculous. Um, the only other supply we need is the LCD backlight. So we distribute a 24-volt supply around the whole thing. Each unit takes 35 milliamps. That's still like 6.3 amps. For the whole installation, um, 150 watts. So obviously it would be you know, we have to run at that high voltage. 25 volt, 24 volts is quite a good compromise. If you go much higher than that, things like fusing and protection start getting a bit of a problem. Things like polyfuses, it gets harder to find polyfuses that don't catch fire in, under a fault condition. Um, and also things like ceramic capacitors get very, a lot more expensive. You get much smaller choice of DC to DC converters. So. Um, 24 volts is often a very, uh, yeah, a very nice midpoint compromise between um, efficiency, keeping the current low, and not getting into like high voltage problems. Certainly, once you get up to 48 volts, it's a, a high current 48 volt supply is actually not that different from an arc welder. So you, you've got to be a bit careful; they, they, they get a bit scary. So for the regulator, um, this company called Alpha and Omega Semiconductors that DigiKey distribute, they do lots and lots of really nice, really cheap power conversion products. If you're looking for a cheap DC-DC converter, um, just check out that range. So 40 cents for this, it's a little SOT236 um, buck regulator, and it will go up to, I think, 30 volts on the input, which is quite nice. And we're using the same device for the, sorry, another of the same device, it's not the same physical device, but another part, the same part for the backlight supply, and that's actually being used in constant current mode. So instead of feeding back the voltage, which you'd normally do on a voltage regulator, we just take the, um, the lead backlight, feed it through a current sent resistor, and then feed that back to the regulator, and that gives us a constant current supply for our backlight. Um, the power supply, because we want this thing to be a nice thin hang on the wall thing, one problem with power supplies is as they increase in power, the form factor, they get bigger in all dimensions. Um, the other issue is that for something like this, we really don't want a fan, and fans, uh, once you get over about 150 watts, small power supplies tend to come with fans on, which you don't want. So we found these quite nice ones. These are from CUI. And they're actually designed to be base plate cool because we've got this, like, this hang on the wall thing. So it's, got, it's a great big chunk of aluminium, beautiful heat sink. So we actually use two of these in series to get a really nice slim mains power supply for this whole thing. Because again, you, know, you don't want this right super expensive. I mean, we're talking something well into five figures of end user price tag here. So you don't want some horrible plastic mains brick hanging out the bottom of it. You know, you, you, you've got to do, do, do these things nicely. Um, so this is the actual um, camera and LC, LCD board. Uh, the, obviously the rear side, so we've got the camera plugged on there facing forward. There was a clip that went over here. I think they actually ended up using a 3D printed clip for that. Um, if I just flip forward a second, oh no. So, ah, where are we? Yeah, so we've got the LCD connector. Unfortunately, obviously the LCD sort of connector, the, the flex comes through this slot and plugs in here. And obviously because the flex on the LCD is a very fixed size, the position of this connector is pretty much fixed. There's not much we can do about it. And we were very, very close to where the camera had to go. And in fact, ideally, this connector should have been a bit further down to keep this ca camera flex straight. But we had to move it up a little bit, so there's actually a little kink in that um, flex, which is why we actually had to use a bracket to clamp the camera down just to stop the flex pushing it off the board, which is, it was a bit of annoying, but, you know, it's the, 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 these things happen. So we've got the 
We've got the PIC, the CPLD, flash memory, two power supplies, RS-485 interface. So, yeah, that, that board is like about that because oh, I've got a single, let me just grab that while I think about it so I can actually show you. Um, this is our basic module of one camera plus one screen. Um, let's just get this out here. So, let's make one pass this around. Um, this is one I just, I just chop, chopped it off. Um, the single, single unit, so I'll pass that around. Um, this is the actual board layout, so it's two layers and you know, most of it's ground plane. Um, I spent many, many years designing single layer boards, so um, I've got pretty good at doing sort of almost single layer boards, but it means you've got a nice, nice solid ground plane, and you know, this is why you don't want BGA packages and hundred you know, things with lots and lots of power supplies. You know, keep, keep it nice and simple, two layers, keep the PCB as cheap as possible. And these are built up into these modules. So this is, a, this is one of the physical boards in the unit. It's basically a, uh, a set of nine, and it's, it's pretty much a copy and replace job. Plus, there's routing to actually you know, route the RS-485 within this board. So each of these boards only needs one cable in and one cable out. Um, there's a few extra connector fittings. This is what won the prototype. So we just, uh, there's a few extra we put just to allow some flexibility on testing and put the cables where it's most convenient. Uh, but it only actually needs one in and one out connector. But obviously the boards are the same, so we have the, the options here because there wasn't any point in actually taking that off. We just, we just don't populate them. So the board ends connect. Now, um, we use flat flex cables. Now, um, there's quite a number of times when I've come across an interconnect issue, and the answer has been flat flex connectors. Um, you can buy them off the shelf in standard lengths. Samtech will do you custom length with no minimum order quantity. So if you want a flat flex cable that long, you can buy one from Samtech and it's not stupidly expensive. Um, the only constraint is they only do multiples of five ways. So it has to be like a 5, 10, 15 way and one or 0.5 mil pitch. But that's, that, that's very useful to know because otherwise, if you look at custom flat flex, it, you know, people tend to ask you, you know, well, how many thousand do you want? So they make them in huge, great wide things and then slice them up later. Um, the connectors are cheap. So it's this type of connector. You stick it in and clamp it down. Um, it's nice and low profile. One advantage, which is not, it's not relevant to this specific one, but it has been in other things I've done, it's the only type of interconnect where the hole that you pass the cable through needs to be no bigger than the cable. Anything else, you've got some sort of connector on a cable, the hole needs to be big enough to get that connector through. So if you want to keep things like really small and neat, again, FSD works, works really nicely for that. Um, so very low profile, you can fold them. Um, you need to be a little bit careful. I wouldn't advise plugging them in under, under power because the connectors are not designed to you know, deal with like the spark when you disconnect your 24 volt supply. You need to be a little bit careful if you pull them out at a slight angle because you can get shorts in between cores. So things like designing the actual order of the, of the um, pins within the cable is quite important. So for example, you don't put 24 volts right next to your data line. You maybe stick a ground in between and maybe you make them symmetrical because the, they come in ver versions like this, but also versions where the, um, the contacts on one end are on the other side. And it can sometimes be a bit of a, you know, if you've got these things connected, it sometimes takes a little bit of thinking as to which way around it needs to do. So if you can actually make it symmetrical, then you don't have to worry about that. It just doesn't matter which way it goes in. Um, but yeah, definitely if you look, I mean, what, dealing with wires are playing, so if you did it with cables, you'd have to get some cable, get someone to crimp the connectors on it, it's, you then have to deal with subcontractors to do that, or sit with a crimp tool, so was that a quick question there? Uh, yeah, what's the current limitation on that? Um, surprisingly good, the one millimetre ones, I think it's something of the order of one amp per core, so it's, it's more than you'd imagine, because it's, it's actually, the actual copper is quite thick. And obviously, again, we, you just multiply up, up, up the, um, the cores. But no, that, it's actually uh, more than you'd imagine. It's somewhere between one and two amps from memory. Um, again, the, the different connectors sometimes have different specs, but it is, it is generally specified in the um, uh, data sheet for the connector, certainly. So, um, yeah. Uh, everything I do with RS-485, I'll put protection in. Most RS-485 drivers are protected up to typically plus 12, minus 7 volts. Um, but above that, they're quite easy to smoke. And even if it's only a very small possibility of getting that short, if everything's connected to the same bus, the results can be catastrophic. You know, you've got to, you know, in this case, 45 things on one bus. So if it's not protected, one short can instantly trash 45 boards, which is really not fun. Um, so generally what I tend to do is I'll put a series polyfuse in there and a Zener diode. So the Zener prevent, protects the voltage spike, then the polyfuse opens to prevent the Zener going, going up in smoke. So that will quite happily withstand a short to 24 volts. And I, I just do that on anything I do with RS-485 because it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's stupid not to. Sorry. Is it the speed of the Zener versus the polyfuse? 
No, no, basically the Zener is what's giving you your protection. So if, if you just put a, the problem is if you just put the Zener in, so you typically use maybe a, a six volt Zener. If you then connect the 24 volts to that six volt Zener, it's not going to last very long before it unsolders itself. So the Zener protects the driver and then the polyfuse protects the Zener. Um, okay, um, are there any artists in the audience? Okay, um, I will apologise in advance if you take any offence from the next slide. <laughs> With all these things, when you're, um, yeah, somebody's actually trying to sell these things for a lot of money, there's a certain additional sort of um, ingredient, which I, I like to call ABS, um, which you can probably guess what that stands for. So um, here, here's a typical example. I've, I've highlighted some of the, the, the key words that, um, if you're trying to write your own, these are the sort of words you should, should uh, tend to use. <laughs> But most of my customers are used to my slightly cynical attitude to these things. So, uh, <laughs> and anyone that, any of them that take really offence, I probably aren't the sort of people I want to work for anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, unexpected, now, interesting, when you do these things, quite often you think it's going to be one thing, but actually the interesting thing is something completely different. Now, this happened on, on this. Unfortunately, I don't have the video to show this, but... What they started doing was, you know, they set these things up and started pulling these arrays of images back. So you've got 180 images all taken from a very slightly different viewpoint. Now, if you then take those images and start uh, basically averaging them together with different offsets, you get what's in effect a large-scale light field camera. So you can take a set of images and by just changing those, those scaling, you can bring different people in and out of focus or highlight um, you know, different parts of the image. And say, I, I wish I had the video, because there's, there's some brilliant videos just showing this. Say, for example, you've got two people standing in front, and you can like, bring one person in, into focus, and, yeah, and also almost do a, a dynamic pan across it, and like a, a sort of focus pull across there. So the next thing we're thinking about doing is, you know, it seems that it's the cameras are far more interesting than the LCDs in terms of what you can do with it. So the next thing we're talking about, I, I think it could be a lot more difficult than it sounds, is to have an array of a few hundred cameras doing this live with live video. So you can take, let's say, a live image of, you know, one example, for example, maybe some sort of publicity thing for a station concourse. You have, you know, you're taking video of a large crowd and you suddenly pull somebody into focus in that image and then track them through um, purely from this static camera array whilst all the other, other things else is going around. So that's in the very early sort of talking about stages. I think um, as far as I'm aware, nobody else has done it. Uh, if we can figure out a way of doing it for a reasonable amount of money, I think it will be quite nice. But there's a lot of very interesting problems. Just do it, yeah, as soon as you go to trying to do this thing in real time, you've got a, a ludicrous amount of data, and it's figuring out how to deal, deal with that um, sensibly. Um, I've just got one little video of, uh, of that thing, which I couldn't get to integrate into LibreOffice, so I'll have to play it separately. Um, which is here. Uh, just gives a rough idea of the, the sort of user experience. But um, so I think long term, the more interesting thing I think is going to be actually using this array of images uh, and doing stuff with that. So, yeah, uh, while well, Emily's doing her thing, uh, any questions? Or you're just captivated by this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, purely just to determine when to start capture. So um, we, uh, I'm trying to remember if we use both. I think we only use V-Sync. Um, again, this is a little while ago, but yeah, I mean, the V-Sync tells you when the frame's starting. The H-Sync, I think, I think, yeah, we generate an interrupt on H-Sync. Um, so that's what the PIC will then use the SPI to send the couple of commands to the LCD to tell it I'm about to give you a line of data and to set the, and then flip the CPLD into its like pass the data through mode and reset its 640 pixel line counter. So we get an interrupt on every line, which is every sort of few tens of microseconds, and VSync is then just used as a, as a global reset to know when we've finished. Yeah, the, the cameras have their own internal auto gain control. Um, this can be both good or bad. Um, for this sort of thing, it sort of works. I think if, we, if we're starting to look at large camera arrays, I think that's something we're gonna, maybe we're going to need to lock, lock the exposure. And again, that's something there's, there's actually quite a lot of controls on the camera. You can lock the, um, 
the, the gain and the exposure time and various other things. But by default, the camera has auto level control. And one useful thing, you, if it's in auto level control, you can actually read back the current level value. So you can actually get a figure that gives you a rough idea of how much light is coming into the cam, which can be quite useful, if, if nothing else, for that idea assignment stuff. Any more? Yeah. You did a series of videos on reverse engineering the iPhone. Yes. Um, not that often. Obviously, for things like the camera module, I had to do a bit of playing around. Um, you know, if you're trying to use these consumer-type pro products, they're often not very well documented. So, for example, on the LCD, I had to figure out what was actually happening with all the orientation flags when you're reading data back, because that was just the data sheet was just meaningless. Um, but uh, n not not all that often. But, yeah, a lot, most of the stuff I do is quite often just fairly standard. You know, bunch of LEDs, bunch of drivers, whatever. It's only these are sort of the more corner case oddball things um, where I have to sort of start doing that sort of thing. I hope you do more. Yeah. I, in fact, the, 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 specifically the iPod Nano thing, that I, I sort of started looking at that. And my client really wanted to use these displays because they're square and they're nice and high resolution. So he just sent me a couple of like, iPod Nanos and said, just go see what you can do with it. And in parallel, they were looking at other LCDs as an option. Because I basically, I tend to scare the crap out of my clients because I just tell them everything that could possibly go wrong. Um, and then you only get nice surprises. So um, I kept saying all along, look, you know, I don't know if this is going to be possible. Even if I can figure it out, it might be too complicated. We might need ridiculous high speed. So I kept saying, look, you know, I don't know if this is possible. And the key, he's like supremely confident. Oh, yeah, Mike, you'll do it. You'll, you'll do it. So after a while, um, I, I, I figured out how to do it. And I sent him an email that said, game over on the iPod Nano screen. And I attached an image, which was a picture of the nano screen showing the text with a picture of him with the letters game over it and on it. <laughs> any more? Yeah. Have you done any outdoor installations? Uh, a few. Um, outdoors is a, an order of magnitude more difficult because just outdoor connectors are a real pain in the butt, sealing things, stopping water to get in, particularly outdoor permanent stuff. Um, outdoor temporary stuff you can get away with, just cover everything in silicone and, uh, uh, and cross your fingers. But um, you really can't skimp on connectors. So, for example, yeah, mold, yeah, for, um, firstly, avoid as many connectors as you can or put the connectors in the dry places. Use molded connectors. Um, but there are some quite... Yes, there's some... Um, yeah, use a wireable waterproof connectors, but they are an absolute pain to wire up. You've got to get screw them together exactly right. You've got to use exactly the right um, uh, sealing grommet for the cable diameter you're using. And there was one project I did about 100 of those and never again. But yeah, if you can find off-the-shelf molded cables, even if they're three times as expensive, use those. Um, but yeah, water and things like outdoor equipment cases, I'll tend to use like die-cast aluminium boxes with sealing gaskets. Um, and certainly you don't want to have anything that's outdoors and in sunlight because then you've got all the UV stuff to go, going on. But, um, yeah, I tend to be extremely cautious. For an outdoor permanent thing, you know, I will not skimp on good quality cable gans, metal cases, good quality connectors, etc. Any more? Right. Okay, thank you very much.